All right, so uh, most of you folks know me. I've been doing this uh, a long time. So um, GS number 13, of course. And uh, uh, I know the, the talks are being uploaded as I speak. I also throw a copy on my own website, ericconrad.com. So I like to give talks uh, quickly. <laughs> I like them fast and furious. I like to give talks the way I like receiving talks. So if you fall a bit behind and uh, want to go back and remember something, it's already on my website right there, ericconrad.com. And it'll be on the conference site, I'm sure, very shortly. So I've been looking at uh, Notpedia, and Notpedia was a game changer. Um, $10 billion in losses, 10 billion with a B, right? And what, what Notpedia did was it married the, well, alleged NSA hacking toolkit based on open source intelligence with some very smart auto pivoting moves. You know, for years, I've been doing pen testing a long time, and uh, a lot of us, me and my friends, people I knew at SANS, people I knew in the industry, were like, yeah, worms are really dumb. They're breeders, not warriors, as Ed, Ed Scotus would say. Yeah, they're good at spreading, but they're not doing much else. And actually, they're not as good at spreading as a human would be. Like back 10 years ago, MSO8067, configure, right? If you had 1,000 boxes and one was unpatched, missing that patch, MSO8067, that one box would get infected, end of story, right? That's not at all true for what a pen tester would do. You know, so it would infect the one box, it would scan the 999, they'd be patched, end of story. But that's not how a pen tester moves at all. A pen tester would find one box, steal credentials, uh, try to elevate their privileges if necessary to system a local admin or admin, and then you know, dump usernames, dump hashes, dump passwords with a tool called Mimikatz, and then pivot laterally through stolen credentials. That's how pen testers move. That's not how worms moved generally until this. So it married these literally weaponized nation state toolkit, allegedly, with the smart human style auto pivoting uh, mechanism. So now 1,000 boxes, one on patch, you could lose all 1,000. And I have, I have had clients lose thousands of boxes. I have one client uh, teetering on the brink of failure. They're likely to go bankrupt and fail and shut down due to this exact strain of malware, right? And they had a couple unpatched. But they were very careless with how they designed their credentials. They weren't using tools like LAPS, et cetera. They had overly flat network. Flat networks fail catastrophically. And not petty, it just bulldozed through this, this kind of stuff, right? So $10 billion is in damage. And I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to like scare them and sell them. I'm not trying to sell you anything. The moral of the story is, if they simply reconfigured what they have, it wouldn't have happened. Like, you don't need a shiny box. You don't need to spend a million dollars. You don't need to buy an appliance or outsource a service. You can just retune the stuff you've already got using stuff like private VLANs, et cetera, host-based firewalls to restrict certain applications from connecting outbound. <clears throat> the Windows firewall, <clears throat> excuse me, can block based on application. Very few of my clients do this. I'm having all of them do this. Why do you allow outbound PS exec uh, from your client desktops, right? Why do you allow that? And your host-based firewall can easily, easily block that. Most people think firewall is blocking based on IP or port. That's all fine. That's good. Block an application is actually very powerful, right? So $10 billion in losses that we know about, and it's probably even larger than that. And it was quite, it was quite destructive. So um, Maersk, there was a big um, write-up in Wired Magazine by Maersk about Maersk, rather. So big shipping company, you've probably seen the, seen the container ships. But when that thing hit, they had trucks lined up for miles, 18 wheelers lined up for miles at ports. And they had a fallback. They, they, they're shipping literally millions of containers on thousands of ships. They had to fall back to paper and pencil to manage all that across the planet, right? And if you read that story, it's fascinating. The malware hit every AD controller in the entire company and nuked it. We call it NotPedia, people call it ransomware, it's not actually ransomware. Uh, the better name is destructive malware. NotPedia was a nation state attack designed to inflict financial harm, I believe. I don't know, I'm inferring. But there was no, ransomware implies you can pay a ransom, get your data back. There was no, no data to get back. It was simply gone, right? And um, it nuked every AD controller primary backup on the planet. It destroyed their AD infrastructure with no backup. But luckily, there was a power outage in Ghana. So there's a power outage in Ghana at the time. One of their AD controllers in Ghana was offline due to basically an act of God, power outage. They had to recover, they, they, they pulled the disks, they were gonna fly those disks to London. They couldn't with their visa fly directly to London. So they had to basically fly somewhere else in Africa, meet in the middle, hand over the disks and go, and that's how they recovered their AD infrastructure. Off a, a, a AD control that was offline due to power outage, right? And so it's, and when you read this stuff, again, it's not a shiny box, it's not buying something, it's just retuning what you have. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're gonna architect for detection, and I'm gonna give you a, a number of examples 
This is pretty much ripped from the headlines, stuff I do with my clients. I walk in, I roll up my sleeves, often post-incident, and I say, okay, let's do this. Uh, and as a consultant, to say, okay, buy this, buy that, buy the other thing. They have a three-month procurement cycle. It's not going to happen while I'm there that week. So I've learned to tune my um, consulting to uh, live off the land. You know, the, the red teamers live off the land. We call them lol bins, right? LOL bins, live off the land binaries. So pen testers have been living off the land, meaning using what's already there to pen test for years. Defenders can also live off the land and simply retune your, your architecture with stuff you've already bought. Maybe a few additional things like a dark net, we'll talk about that, and uh, defend. So let's talk about some auditing. I'm going to focus on how to configure the auditing, not, not what to look for. I'm focusing on architecture here, but we'll talk a bit about that as well. And of course, as many of you know, uh, command line auditing is now built in in Windows 7 Plus. So if you put a gun to my head and said, Eric, in your sim, you get one event. What event is that? You only get one. Pick one. I say security log 4688 with those two changes made. With those two changes made, you're now logging every command line, right? And uh, there's, there's an old saying, I've said it before, it talks like this, sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Sunlight is the best disinfectant, and the malware likes to hide. Natively, there's no logging of command line, so a lot of the malware, not Petya was like this too, not Petya moved through WMIC, and until, well, at that time, there was, effect, there was effectively no good auditing of WMIC uh, with built-in tools. You could use something like Tanium, whatever, our carbon black, but uh, natively, before Notpedia, w, WMIC had no good um, auditing, and now Sysmon has added that in direct response to Notpedia, right? So you want to turn on auditing of WMIC, which I'll get to shortly, of PowerShell, which I'll get to next, and of command lines, right? Feed that into your sim. There's a tool I've given talks on at DerbyCon called Deep Blue CLI. You want to look that tool up, Deep Blue CLI, audits these logs and PowerShell logs, et cetera. And once you've done that, what do you look for? The single best thing to look for is really, really long commands, uh, irrespective of what's in them. Really, really long commands, like over 1,000 bytes, right? Now, is every 1,000 plus byte command um, evil? No, no. You need to have a whitelist. Uh, Google likes to create long command lines as well. The reason they're creating long command lines is they're going fileless. Fileless means don't save anything to the file system. Either run a giant command line that is usually a compressed and then Base64 encoded, or use uh, PowerShell's NetWeb download client string to download something WGET style, right? But it ends up creating these very long commands. Google also does this, why? To avoid saving stuff to the file system. Every time you, you save something to a file system, there's a chance of failure for Google, or there's a chance of being detected for malware, right? So um, various things to look for. Also, CMD launching PowerShell. P is exec launching CMD, launching PowerShell. You see these chains of things forming, especially 32-bit. If, if you're on a desktop and you double click on PowerShell types and commands on a 64-bit system, you're generally running that 64 bits. Most malware, probably 99% of malware is 32-bit, right? Because 32-bit will work on both 64 and 32-bit systems. I'm not saying all 32-bit PowerShell is evil, but it's another indicator of, of compromise, of suspicion, right? So really long commands, CMDs launching PowerShell, 32-bit stuff launching PowerShell, things like that. And um, we'll talk about PSExec shortly. Uh, we're looking at what, what, what Windows and Microsoft would call ASEPs, Auto Start Extensibility Points, a way to survive a reboot. Look for those as well, of course. Use a tool like Sys uh, Internals Auto Runs. Now, PowerShell logging. Um, you want to go to Windows, uh, PowerShell rather 5 or ideally 5.1. Uh, Windows 7 has PowerShell 2 by default, which has no useful logging for our purposes. It's, there's no auditing of, of security events with PowerShell 2. PowerShell 4 adds more, 5 adds even more, 5.1 is even better. The beauty of 5 is you can go straight from PowerShell 2 to 5.1 in one shot. Previously, with PowerShell 5, you up, uh, had to upgrade to 4 and then to 5, not the end of the world, but another step. Now you can go directly to 5.1. You really, really want to uh, get PowerShell auditing. Otherwise, it's a complete blind spot. And remember, sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Uh, most malware has moved to PowerShell. Uh, Metasploits, payloads, um, post-exploitation stuff has moved to PowerShell. Because it's powerful, they're living off the land, right? and um, natively no logging, right? So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, PowerShell is going to be whitelisted if you're using application whitelisting. PowerShell is generally going to be allowed by your Tanium or your uh, next generation, whatever, carbon black, et cetera, and there's no logging. This is uh, ideal for the malware and not ideal for us. So I would up there's all kinds of other reasons you want a newer PowerShell as well. You know, you can talk for hours about why you want newer PowerShell. You can also, in this case, encrypt the logs. If you're worried about sensitive data being exposed when you log commands, you can do it encrypted here, right? So uh, upgrade everything to PowerShell 5, 
Start logging that stuff, and once again, look for very, very long uh, commands. Uh, Deep Blue CLI uh, also looks for that stuff as well. Sysmon's wonderful. Mark Rasinovich of Sysinternals. Uh, Microsoft acquired that company a number of years ago, and um, he's very tactical. When he sees WMIC moving via WMI, and our WMIC, um, and he realizes Windows, the only logging we had previous to this was basically debug logging on WMIC, which wasn't recommended in a um, production environment because it was a big performance hit. He added uh, WMIC logging to PowerShell like weeks after NotPedia hit. So he can move very quickly. He can innovate very quickly, much quicker than Microsoft tends to innovate. Microsoft's comes miles and miles. They're now a leader in security, but they're a big company. He feels like a small, he still feels, feels like startup mode inside sysinternals. He's able to be very tactical and very fast. When he sees WMIC moving through a basically unlogged channel, making it blind, he added WMIC logging to Sysmon. The beauty of Sysmon is it, um, it scales to you know, global sizes. It plays nicely with your SIM and all that good stuff. Of course, it's free. And you have a lot of nice logging, including WMI, right? So uh, that brings some sunlight as you want to look in. So the, the, the point of this section is make sure you've got the logs. Make sure you've got the command line auditing, the PowerShell auditing, uh, the, the Sysmon auditing. One beauty of Sysmon, one of my favorite features of Sysmon, is you can log the hash of every single running process and DLL in your entire environment. That is powerful. That is powerful. That gives you visibility. By running Sysmon and grabbing a hash of every running process, you basically created a massively distributed application aware IDS, is what you've done. Because you've seen every application, every DLL running on every system, the entire company. That visibility is amazing. As a defender, it is amazing. You can do stuff like import hash, which is a whole other talk I, I want to write on import hash, which is amazing. It, it hashes the order the DLLs are loaded, which is powerful for catching uh, whole families of malware, right? The imp hash. So for years, I said, yeah, so well, here's what you should do in 5.11. I'm teaching 5.11 this week. Uh, the, the, um, the, the new version actually debuts in two days. I'm very excited. And for a long time, we had this slide saying uh, a belt and suspenders, poor man's detective uh, application whitelisting process. I said, tell you what, here's what you should do. Uh, gra take Sysmon, grab the SHA-256 of every running process, use um, VirusTotal's free API to auto-submit that stuff, detect malware for free. Because uh, VirusTotal has a free API, you submit one hash or at least once every 15 seconds for free. You can buy more access if you want. And I said, yeah, you should go write that tool. What I realized when I said you should write that tool, maybe some people do, but they don't share it usually. Sometimes they do. It's just awesome. I'm like, you know what, I, sh I should write that tool. I should write that tool. How hard could it be? Not hard. And so I wrote Deep White. Deep White takes the free API from VirusTotal, allowing to make one submission every 15 seconds. If, you, if it has more than you know, one submission, it just does a sleep cycle every 15 seconds. It looks up the malware or the, or the binary or whatever it is. And once it looks it up once, it won't look it up again unless you tell it to. It supports a whitelist, right? And it works really, really well all for free, right? So it automates this. There's an old saying from the programming world, if you typed it twice, you should have scripted it once. And I've done stuff like this more than twice, I can tell you that, way more than twice. Where I grab the hash from Sysmon, there it is there. SHA-256 seems pretty portable, other ones can work too, but in my testing, SHA-256 seemed to be the sweet spot of portability and usability. And basically, you can copy paste that hash throw right into VirusTotal, and VirusTotal will tell you what it thinks from 60 odd antivirus vendors for free. And I thought I should script that, so I scripted that, right? Now, if you get one hit, don't freak out like I did, okay? <laughs> I ran Deep White on the 5.11 VM that I've handed out to literally thousands of students. Deep White found like five things, and I started hyperventilating. I almost had a heart attack. That means, like, I gave malware to 1,000 plus students. I'm, I'm gonna have to leave the country and change my name and get a new identity. I'm like, screwed, it's over, it's over. And I'm like, calm down, like one hit, why one hit? For instance, Sophos um, will flag PS exec, the actual PS exec signed by Microsoft. Why? Bad things are done to PS exec. Bad, bad things have happened to PS exec. But PS exec is a tool. You know, I can use a hammer to build a house, I can use a hammer to smash a window. PS exec has the same thing, right? So the fact that they call it a PUA, potentially unwanted application. Okay. So you get one or two um, virus total hits, don't hyperventilate, I mean, investigate, investigate, but don't hyperventilate like I did, don't leave the country, et cetera. Uh, the other thing, if there's, if there's binaries on your system that aren't signed, many, many vendors will give a much more thorough check, and even Microsoft doesn't sign everything. They sign like 99% of stuff plus, there's a few things they don't sign, like .NET framework stuff that may be older, 
And some vendors will actually do very aggressive checks on that and flag it through heuristics. So one or two hits, don't freak out too much. This works really well. I've got clients of mine who are checking every DLL, every EXE. Uh, you don't have to check everything. You can say, if it's not signed by Microsoft, check it, for example. You can tell the system on the same thing. You know, give me the hash of everything not signed by Microsoft. That's interesting. It also makes your job much easier, right? I've had clients turn this on across tens of thousands of systems. Every single one has found malware. All of them have found malware. So it gives you that massive visibility in your environment for free, using free tools, and it's amazing, right? All right, DNS. Um, in a Windows environment, you, again, you put, put a gun to my head. What's the one log you want? You want, oh, well, Windows event logs. If I get a second log source, I want DNS. Now, not for the reasons most people think. Most people log DNS for correlation, and that's all fine. I love correlation, but DNS can actually be more powerful than that. You can threat hunt through DNS. Even without correlating, you can still threat hunt through DNS. DNS is some of the easiest logs you can get to. So turn this on. Why? Um, it's the best C2 channel. DNS is the best C2 channel command and control. Command and control is how the attacker controls the compromised asset that they've owned inside your environment. And there's lots of ways to do C2. We've had C2 for decades now. My favorite way, and I do it on every pen test to prove the point, DNS. DNS uh, allows a bi-directional channel back to the internet. As long as, if I can resolve a name, I can tunnel to the internet. I can tunnel any IP protocol via DNS. There's a tool called Iodine. Iodine allows tunneling any v4 protocol via DNS. There's a tool called DNS Cat 2, which does that for TCP. Iodine does it for all IP. You can do IPsec through DNS. You can do SSH through DNS, whatever you want. And um, I always do an iodine tunnel on a pen test to prove to my client that they don't see it. I've never, I've never had a DNS tunnel fail. The only, I mean, people are like, Eric, it's a lockdown subnet. There's no internet access. And I walk up and I type nslookupgoogle.com and I get an answer. That's internet access, right? Like, well, it's going through a DNS resolver. Yeah, a DNS resolver is a DNS proxy. We don't think of them that way. That's exactly what they are. A DNS resolver is a DNS proxy, right? And if I can type nslookupgoogle.com, so basically, you know, um, or, or blank x.google.com, you know, blah blah blah.google.com. If I hit enter, blah 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 goes to uh, google.com's primary name server. And google.com sends a response back. That's bi directional in, uh, internet connectivity. So on every pen test, uh, I set up a DNS tunnel. It's always worked. I've never been caught, ever, right? Our preventive controls for this stuff are poor. IDSs like Snort Suricata using every rule set I could find generally fail, right? And again, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We need, we need some visibility in here. Here's an example of the Zeus botnet. What most vendors have done for decades now, oh, uh, zonesnaws.com, you're evil. You're evil, I'm gonna blacklist you. And the, and the, the black hats are laughing because with domain generation algorithms, you can play that game all day long. I'll show you the handiwork of a DGA very shortly. But if I blacklist that, right, so someone gets a piece of malware, the Zeus botnet, someone recognizes that name, says, okay, let's put that on, on a blacklist or a reputation filter. Hours are going by, days are going by, right? By the time you actually blacklist that, then they moved on to another one. This is not resolution, this is bi-directional communication. And by the way, the pro tip, that was the 1,293rd thing that thing did, because you start counting at zero. This thing resolved zero, resolved, 0.pf.zones.com, 1.pf.zones.com, dot, 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 12,192, right? So one pro tip for finding stuff like this, look for something resolving hundreds or thousands of, of names or, or, or um, subdomains within a domain. Like how many different names do you go to .google.com? www.google.com, mail.google.com, maps.google.com. For Google, maybe six, 10, or 20, not 1,000. Not a thousand different strings .google.com. No one does that publicly. Now maybe internally you do that, but do you resolve thousands of names dot something dot something on the internet? Probably not. And this thing just resolved over 12,000 names within one domain, right? So it's really easy to catch with Bro. It's a trivial scripting exercise. Look for thousands of names dot something dot something. You'll catch all kinds of tunnels like this, right? So again, it's, um, it's an ideal channel. And this gives you bi-directional internet access, as long as I can resolve a name, through any number of resolvers. Even if I can't browse the internet, like on the web, if I can resolve a public name, that's bi-directional. And here is iodine, right? And um, another pro tip, null records. I, I, you know, old man Conrad here, just Mark called me. <laughs> one of the things I call myself, I'm an old man Conrad movement. I've been configuring DNS since 1991. Wow, that dude's old. Yeah, I'm old, I know. I, I'm not trying to be, I, I know everything, but I never heard of null records till like last year. 
I've configured DNS since 1991. I've never heard of a null record. A null record allows any arbitrary binary data via DNS. What? Yeah, it does, right? Any binary data via DNS has been supported since the 80s. I've never seen them used for anything but malice, ever. You can block this stuff on, on Windows DNS. You can use an RPZ, a response policy zone, on bind to block this stuff. Now, obviously, you want to test, but you want to block an alert. You see null records. Uh, I've never seen them used for anything but evil. And now, if you have an actual use case where you're using these things, please let me know. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear what the actual use case is. It's this weird, just uh, experimental thing from the 80s that's still there, kind of like your appendix. It's just there. There's no need for it, really, but it's still there, you know? So, um, null records. And this is, um, I, I bought a domain called uh, eej.me. Um, uh, Montenegro had a, a $1 sale one year on .me domains, and they're short. And uh, I, I grabbed the .me domain. Uh, you can get um, stand-up, because I tell people, how do I test this stuff is my advice, right? How do I test this? How do I see if my sock would catch this, my sim would catch this? Well, buy a domain online. You can go to namecheap.com. They always have an 88 cent sale. So spend 88 cents on a domain. You can get a cheap Linux VM in Amazon's cloud for 10 bucks a month while it's running. Or you can get cheaper ones if you want it on all the time. But while it's running 10 bucks a month, meaning you run it for a day, you're talking pennies, right? And configure that as your primary DNS server, use iodine, bang. And I recommend you test this. It's pretty straightforward to test this. I have more detail on this if you want to, uh, I have actually more slides on setting that part up. So if you want to set that up yourself, email me. My email is econrad at gmail.com. You also have my website, econrad.com. Lots of ways to reach me. But if you want more technical details, I have more slides on setting that up if you want to test that. I recommend you test that. And the question is, did anyone notice? Get permission first, of course. My experience, no one notices this stuff. So one of the things we've looked at, because if you look at these names, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, the, 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 um, not only is, is the, the null records weird, but the actual domains themselves are weirdest too. Look at those big, long null records, a few, a few uh, lines down now. Big, long uh, null records, right? And big, long names that are randomly generated. So me and Seth were looking at this problem of entropy. How do you t detect entropy? Like, how do I know? I can look at a string and say that thing's randomly generated as a human. But as a, as a script, can we script that, right? Can we script detection of randomly generated strings used for things like DNS, et cetera? And me and Seth are like, oh, that's easy. I'll just use ENT, good old ENT. ENT calculates the entropy, the, the Claude Shannon entropy. Entropy means disorder, randomness. It's a cryptographic term. We'll just use ENT. Easy peasy, right? I'm like, well, not really. To a cryptographer, a DNS name is not high entropy. It can never be high entropy. Because you're, you're talking, it ignores case. So you're talking 26 uh, letters, 10 numbers, and a few symbols, right? So if you're using only letters and numbers, you're talking 14% of ASCII. You're using, that's not random. You, if you're using 14% of ASCII to generate a name, that is very orderly to a crypt, crypt analyst, right? To a cryptologist. That's very orderly, right? So you use ANT, the scores are low, uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's only using a fraction of ASCII. So we kicked it around, and we never actually wrote the tool. And luckily for us, we know a lot of smart people, right? I know a lot of smart people. And Mark Bag was taking 5.11 because he was trying to expand his Python class to six days from five, add some blue team goodness, right? And he says, like, hey, Mark, figure that out. Just figure that thing out. Me and Conrad looked at that thing with Ant. We, we failed utterly. You, you're a Python ninja. Do it. He's like, clickety, 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 click. First break. There you go. Done, right? <laughs> he had it written by first break, freak.py. And you feed it a corpus. And the beauty of freak.py, and yes, as a server as well, if you want to do this at scale, you feed it a corpus. The corpus could be the uh, Cisco Umbrella top million, right? Uh, the Alexa top million, very famous, but now commercial. Uh, if you want the Alexa top million, the top million website, you have to pay for it, right? They made that commercial. It used to be free, now it's commercial. Cisco stepped up with OpenDNS and said, hey, here's the top million uh, uh, names, DNS names on the planet. So feed it the, the Cisco Umbrella top million. That's your corpus. And what it does is it looks for letter combinations. How likely is one character to follow the next, right? If you look at English names, uh, Q is usually followed by U and not very often followed by Z or W, right? So feed it a corpus of anything you want. Every EXE on your clean Windows 10 installation image, right? That's now your corpus for uh, uh, finding randomly generated uh, EXE names. Or the, the, the Cisco Umbrella Top Million. That's your corpus for um, finding weird domain names like these. So uh, USDOD actually funded me to do some research on ransomware. Um, my, my, my biggest client, excuse me, is USDOD. They said, uh, hey, Conrad, can you spend like, you know, six weeks in your office infecting yourself over and over with ransomware 
and give us some lessons learned. I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that, right? So I channeled my true inner user. I clicked yes to everything. I agreed to everything. All the macros got turned on. Yes, yes, click, click. You know, bank, bank account fraud, oh no, click, click. I, I, channeled, I, was, I was layer eight. I lived layer eight for six weeks, right? I clicked on everything. I looked at everything. And then what they wanted me to do was, uh, how do we detect that? How do we prevent and detect that stuff, DOD? And it is really obvious, that stuff. The ransomware, is, is, it is not subtle at all. It creates often thousands, tens of thousands of failed resolutions, because the old uh, pf.zonesnaws.com, right? The reason that fails now is it's zonesnaws.com for this next four hours. And then it's something else, and then it's, every four hours it'll cycle. So the malware comes preloaded with a list of sometimes 100 names that cycle every four hours, generated off an algorithm, domain generation algorithm, right? So every four hours, it'll get a new list of 100, it'll resolve one of them. So it'll try to resolve 100 names, 99 fail, one will work, and it looks just like these. This is actual ransom, I looked at for DOD, right there. And so, and it does, in the end, it's having tens of thousands of DNS failures, only a handful work, and the handful that do work look just like this, right? Often weird domains like dot .work and dot, dot .whatever, dot .info, not, well, dot .work, I suppose, or uh, all kinds of weird stuff like that, and uh, dot .click, for example. And most people treat DNS as a, as a service like, like electricity. It's binary. It's working or it's not, right? The only time you hear about DNS is when it fails, right? How about we log it, look for massive failures in DNS resolution. Now, this is something I call the, open wi the, um, the broken windows theory of network engineering. You're going to have a lot of DNS failures regardless, even absent of malware, right? Stuff's broken, misconfigured stuff, bad settings, just dead domains, whatever. When you first turn on DNS logging, you will likely see thousands and thousands of failed resolutions due to broken stuff. Some broken stuff you control internally, being bad settings internally. Some broken stuff you don't control on the internet. But when you turn on DNS uh, logging and look for failures, you'll find internal assets that are misconfigured that, that are failing. I had, we, we did this on one client, the DNS server settings, the first two of three were wrong for a, a pool of 100 servers. So the first two of three were wrong due to layer eight, the, the unofficial OSI model layer, the user, by the way, layer eight, right? And layer eight mistakes, the first two of, of three DNS settings were wrong. So the, the first one try timeout 10 seconds later. The second one try timeout 10 seconds later. The third one worked, but every single lookup was roughly a 20 second delay, right? And no one, it was working, air quotes, it was working not well. Right? And the broken windows theory of network engineering says fix that, fix all that stuff. As you start peering at that network with a microscope, you'll find all kinds of broken stuff. You will. Fix it. And so I fixed it. I said, listen, your DNS settings are wrong. You're creating literally millions of failed uh, resolutions. I can't track malware anymore. It's so noisy. Let's fix it. So those reports took like four to five hours to run because every single DNS lookup took 20 seconds, roughly. We fixed it. Those reports ran in 45 minutes. So they went from four hours to 45 minutes because we fixed the problem that we spotted in the SOC, right? So a lot of people, you know, security kind of butting heads with operations, operations, we're trying to get work done here, and security is being viewed as a team of professional nags. I've been there, I've done that, right? You're opening tickets, you're viewed as a nag, you're viewed as friction, you're, you're adding delays to the operations team. I've, I've seen that kind of contentious, you know, ops versus security thing many times. I've lived that. And all of a sudden, the, the four and a half hour reports taking 45 minutes, Suddenly we're best buddies now. Operations loves you now because you're solving problems for them, right? Beyond that, not just uh, DNS names. Again, um, feed, uh, take your Windows 10 installation image, grab every EXE and DLL off that thing, the name of it, I mean. Feed that into freak.py as a corpus and now run that across everything. Show me any name that's unlike this. Show me any name with one character following the next is unlike our entire corpus. You'll find interesting stuff. And does it scale? Yes, it scales. Uh, Justin scaled this to uh, hundreds of thousands per second. Uh, it scales. So we love freak.py so much, we try to run uh, every DNS resolution across hundreds of sites through it, and the Python script just exploded, because it's a script, right? And we said, hey, Mark, can you write like a service where basically I send a string to a TCP port and it gives me a number? I send it a string, you know, I give it a corpus, then I send it a string and it gives me a number. The number tells me how random that thing appears to be. Mark's like, clickety, 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 click. Half an hour later, here you go. Freak as a service, right? So it scales. Now, I was doing some work on this. I was finishing this up on Sunday. And I was looking at this. Internationalized domain names uh, leading to the homograph attack. The homograph attack leads to um, Unicode DNS. 
Unicode DNS were YouTube.com. That's, that's not the YouTube you know. And character by character, pixel by pixel, it's perfect. Why? There's Unicode uh, characters in there. Unicode is multi-button encoding. English fits neatly in ASCII, which, as you know, holds 256 characters. So English, 26 upper, 26 lower, number symbol, that fits easily in ASCII. But you want to do kanji and Cyrillic and many, many other emojis, all that kind of stuff won't fit in ASCII. There's only, it's a one-byte value. So we have two-byte Unicode, we have four-byte Unicode, et cetera. And that thing, pixel by pixel, is YouTube as far as the pixels go. We can also buy a cert for that thing because we own that domain. It's not the YouTube you're used to. So I was looking at this on Sunday. I was wrapping this talk up. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, I thought we fixed this. I thought we fixed this. Look at that. That's Firefox on Sunday. Fully patched Firefox going to, quote, apple.com with a valid cert, right? Now, users will fall for um, phishing campaigns generally anyways. Something that good? I'd fall for that. I would. I could easily fall for that. That's not apple.com. Not, not the one you think of, right? Chrome got it right. Well, mostly right. I'll show you that. Chrome got it right. And Firefox today got it wrong. I'm like, I thought we fixed this. I thought this the whole thing came out like a year and a half ago, and all the browsers updated. And I was pretty surprised, because I, I hadn't been following it very closely. Firefox failed. Well, I guess succeeded for the attacker's standpoint, right? And again, if I buy apple.com, and the P is a Cyrillic P, not, a, not an uh, English P, but it's, it's perfect character by character, I could buy a cert for that too. Why? I'm the who is technical contact. I can answer that email. So I can get a cert for it, just like we did here. And so I'm like, um, yeah, I, I thought we fixed this. I thought we fixed this. And so jo John Hubbard to the rescue, literally on Sunday. I know a lot of smart people, and they follow me on Twitter, and I follow them back. And sometimes it's actually faster than Googling just asking stuff on Twitter. I just, you know, I just ask Twitter. I'm like, didn't we figure this out? Like, I, I thought we figured this out. I haven't been following closely, but I thought we figured this out. And John's like, clickety-click, literally five minutes later. Five minutes later, with a reference and everything. I mean, five minutes, John, where were you? He, he, he left me hanging for five whole minutes, man. Not cool. And uh, with a reference, a shout out to 450, Blue Team Fundamentals, a, uh, a, a new course in, in our, um, our Blue Team curriculum. Uh, very excited about that. So John's writing that class. It's a passion project for me. He's like, yeah, well, there's a setting that's complicated. And, yeah, and, and notice, so, so Chrome got it right in the, um, in the address bar, because that, that's the same site in the address bar in Chrome. But it got it wrong on the actual link. The link, now the, the L looks a little off, but a user will fall for that. A user will fall for that. So we really haven't fixed this at all. And your users are subject to this right now. And again, if I would fall for it, I, I could easily fall for one of these phishing campaigns, meaning your users probably will. You, you need to protect them against this, right? How do you do it? Um, well, here's how you, you configure the browsers. So Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Edge, and IE, they all have, oh, did you, I just read yesterday. Um, they're adding Chrome to, to uh, they're adding Chrome to, Microsoft's adding Chrome to their browser. They're, they're ditching Edge and going to Chrome. I'm like, what? Cats and dogs living together? Mass hysteria, my friends. Chrome's in IE? What? So anyways, very exciting. <laughs> so all the browsers treat this slightly differently. All your users are at risk right now to the, these attacks. And I strongly recommend you, you look at your browser settings, because if I surf to a site, I want to see what Chrome does, not what, not what Firefox does today, by default, OK? All right, so that's how you do it. And that's thanks to John. Two of those slides from John Hubbard. Thank you, John. So how do I programmatically detect or block this stuff, right? Uh, hardening the browsers is good, but there's all kinds of ways to get you. There's the address and the address bar of the browser. There's a link rendered in the browser. There's a link rendered in the email. There's lots of ways to get hit with this stuff, right? Lots of vectors for this now, right? DNS twist. DNS twist uh, catches this stuff. It's, it's, how similar are these two names? If my d domain is ericconrad.com, and you see a domain ericconrad.com, but the O is a Cyrillic O that looks just like an English O, but it's a Cyrillic O, can we detect that? Yes, DNS twist can do that. DNS twist can also catch what we call cousin domains, lookalike domains. Sec530.com versus sec530.com. That's in order of what's listed there. 53 capital O, 530, right? Can we programmatically detect this? We have our uh, next-gen firewall or proxy automatically detect or block this, right? Yes, right? And um, also with email as well, I'm a big fan of um, email is a good use case for a quarantine, or at least a temporary quarantine. You see email coming in from a cousin domain, right? Or what DNS Twist thinks is a cousin domain, and you think, well, I don't want to block it. That could be an executive thing. I've learned, especially with email, if you, if you run your own mail server now, now there's, there's pros and cons to that, of course, but if you run your own mail server, how about you queue it for an hour and let your SOC decide? If they don't decide within an hour, let it through, right? I've done stuff like this throughout my career. 
very, very effectively. There are cases when you want to block, there are cases when you don't want to block, and there's cases in the middle where you're not sure. You want more time. Now, more time on the web is going to be tricky, right, because they're clicking now, right? But mail, holding mail for an hour probably isn't the end of the world, or half an hour, whatever you want, right? So DNS twist score is high enough, uh, have the email queue for an hour, let's say, while your SOC investigates. If no one acts, it goes through after an hour, things like that. Or at minimum, tell them what's going on. Now, if you're simply alerting on this stuff, the bad news is someone created a cousin domain or homograph attack, and they're attacking you now. Your users are receiving that. The good news is your SOC knows within almost immediately. Average dwell time now is uh, 101 days in the US per Mandiant. Dwell time is how long the malware is in before you know. It was 99 last year, and now it's 101 this year in the US. Statistically, pretty much the same, I suppose. But um, if you know within minutes, that's better than 101 days, certainly, right? So um, look at this stuff. Uh, log DNS, of course. And here's how you do it on Windows 2008, 2012. Microsoft recently approved their DNS logging. It used to be a flat text file, boo hiss, I know. But now they have actually the analytics now. A lot of good papers on this too. Uh, turn on DNS analytical logging on Windows 2012 uh, R2 Plus. It, it logs through Windows event logs. It plays nicely with your SIM, et cetera. Great article on this stuff here. A lot of good resources here for threat hunting through DNS. So I recommend you look at that for threat hunting through DNS. Uh, and of course, bind nine as well. That's how you do it on bind nine. Pretty straightforward. All right. Um, not Pedia. Why do you allow non-IT clients to talk to? Uh, uh, why, why do you allow non-IT clients to talk to other non-IT clients? Uh, why do you allow that? Is there a need for that? Yes, there are some use cases where it's necessary. For four of my five clients, there was no business need whatsoever to allow uh, a non-IT client to talk to a non-IT client. Right. So one of my favorite subjects, I try to put a, a private VLAN slide in any talk I give on a uh, material like this, right? So private VLAN is stop uh, clients talking to clients, right? Non-IT clients. Basically segment your network, create VLANs. You have server VLANs, you have the IT client VLAN, and there's all the other clients. All the other clients, they don't talk to each other. This is a 10 minute configuration change on your switches plus testing, right? We'll talk about the use cases shortly where you might need that to happen. At the end of the day, I don't want clients talking to clients. If you can do that at layer two, Great. If a host-based firewall is better for you, great. I don't care what layer we do it at, right? But I don't want clients talking to clients. If you have 10,000 uh, non-IT clients, 50 IT clients plus servers, you turn this on, those 10,000 can't talk to each other. I mean, will they talk to each other normally? Sure. Net bias broadcast, stuff like that. Do they need to? Usually not. Usually not. Here are some use cases where, where they may need to, right? So sure, audio video conferencing comes up a lot. Video chat, audio chat. These often work peer-to-peer -peer fashion. All the enterprise ones I'm familiar with, including Cisco, can go client-server. Uh, Tanium does this client-to-client. -client. They're now adding a uh, client-server model as well, uh, due to, because Tanium uh, initially broke private VLANs. They made it impossible to use them, right? Because of the client, the client updates, they're now adding a client-server model to fix that, right? Windows 10 has this insane delivery optimization mode. I call it, it's insane, here's why. You can download patches from other PCs, okay, locally or on the internet. Yeah, there's a button you can press, not by default. You can download patches from some random PC anywhere on the internet, any country. What? What? Seriously? Like, is this an Onion article? What? what? And, I, and I'm reading this, I'm like, and, and, and I'm sure the uh, cryptographer's like, but Eric, it's signed. It's signed. Cryptography. I'm like, yeah, logically you're right, but my gut says, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not downloading patches from random PCs. Oh, it's blockchain? All right, all right. <laughs> Blockchain makes everything better. All right, all right, we, we fixed it with blockchain. All right, very good, very good. Um, so if you have a use case where non-IT clients need to talk to each other, use a, private, uh, use a personal firewall to achieve the same goal. I don't care what layer you do it at, don't let clients talk to clients. Now, when that one user walks in, one of my clients got hit with Notpedia. User at home had Notpedia. Their PC was acting funny, carried it into work and plugged it in. And that company may fail because of that act, layer eight. Hey, maybe IT can help me fix this. They walked it in, they plugged it into a client VLAN. That client could reach every, every system in the company, flat, flat network, bang. The company may fail, right, due to layer eight. And that network it was not resilient enough, clearly, clearly, right? And um, also, uh, just Jessica Payne talks about this a lot. Why do you allow outbound PowerShell from your non-IT clients? Why do you allow outbound WMIC from your non-IT clients? Why do you allow PSExec, RPC, things like that? Now, maybe you need to mount a share somewhere, fine, but there's lots of applications you could actually block. You could actually block the application 
based on the application name. This is powerful. This is not utilized nearly enough. This is very, very powerful to block by application. So again, some basic um, sanitization of your networks, normal clients, IT clients, servers, and your normal clients have this stuff blocked. Obviously, you test. You may have a case where you need PSExec to uh, one server subnet, fine. Allow PSExec to that one server subnet and nowhere else. Don't allow it to the internet, for example, et cetera. This is very underutilized. None of my clients are doing this. I really see people blocking by application in the wild. Windows Firewall can do this right now. Your firewall can do this right now. So consider that functionality, look at your non-IT clients and restrict what they can do. If, if I'm a pen tester on a box where these things are blocked, I'm screwed. Like I'm not saying I can't pivot out of that thing, but you made it much, much harder to pivot out of that thing. And of course, log. First thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna download, I'm gonna run Mimikatz, I'm gonna I'm run the, um, the, the, the PowerShell Empire version of Mimikatz, which is gonna use PowerShell to the internet, which is gonna fail, if you configure this, and your SOC now knows. So this PC in the executive wing just had you know, 17 blocks on banned applications. Your SOC now knows, could I pivot out of that? Could I work around it as a pen tester? Yes, but your SOC's on the case now. Within minutes of me getting in, your SOC's on the case, and I'm probably being kicked to the curb. All right, I'm gonna end on IP darknets. One of my favorite subjects, this little black magic I picked up in the 90s, and uh, I never see people doing this stuff, but you should. So the term darknet has been kind of co-opted by the dark web. Now, an IP darknet means, it still means, IP space you own but don't use. That's what it means. Now I know darknet's been co-opted, but an IP darknet is unrouted space that you own. Even private space. I know you don't own the private space, but you're using 192.168.1.0 as your server network, 2 and 3 and 4.0 as your client network, and that's it. Now in 99% of the shops in the world plus, you're simply not routing 0.0 or uh, 5.0 or 6.0 or 7. You're just not routing them. So any traffic going to them goes nowhere. There's no route. No route, packet, doesn't go anywhere, done. I say route it. Route it to a darknet router. Route dot zero and route dot five through dot two five five to a darknet router. This is not on the internet, now. I'm talking internally. Public, pub, public darknets are useful for other, other purposes, but I'm talking internal darknets now, okay? Internal darknets, right? And why would I want to route traffic that I'm not using? Scanning, right, scanning. Here's um, the witty worm, one of the most evil worms in internet history. Caught by Team Kumri with a darknet router. Darknet router caught it. It's, it's, it was my fastest IDS in my last company, right? So we set up darknets. Internal, all of a sudden the darknet goes crazy. And you may see darknet traffic due to, um, again, broken, misconfigured stuff. Fix that. So my rule was if darknet traffic ever leaped by a factor of two, alert. So if I ever had a burst in, in scanning, and sure enough, at 3 a.m., we, we had a hot pager, and a hot phone, basically. Phone goes off, there was a 1,000% a, a increase, increase in darknet scanning, right? Pen tester rolls out of bed, looks at it, it's an incident, there's a PC in the, in the food service area that, that's scanning the entire class B, right? Uh, isolates the PC, contains the incident, and at a look at the we, we, forensic investigation of, of the PC, they were using Core Impact. I'm like, Core Impact? Core Impact is a very expensive pen testing tool. I'm like, that's probably not a black hat, that's probably an actual pen tester. Like pen testers use Core Impact, and my internal audit, auditing team like to have a secret pen test without telling me, un unannounced pen test. And I call the, I call the, core, uh, the internal auditing team, I'm like, are you guys running a pen test right now? Like, who told you that? Who told you that, Conrad? It was supposed to be unannounced, who told you? I'm like, well, the darknet router told me that. That was a big four accounting firm. Big four accounting firm hopped in a box, launched an NMAP scan, we knew within 30 seconds, because our, our darknet router went off, right? And uh, we handled the incident, we contained the incident, we kicked them to the curb, they never got back in. They had shell for less than five minutes. They had shell for less than five minutes and boom, never got back in. As a pen tester, that's the worst thing ever. Like literally, if that happened to be 10 years later, I'm like, oh, I remember that time I had shell for five minutes and I lost it, oh. Like, I would never get over that. I, like, I would never get over that. So the big four accounting firm comes in, they gave the reveal and the reveal, the reveal was, Five minutes shell, uh, no, no further access, and a pen test. They're like, they walk in, you know, they're, they're all wearing suits, three dudes, $250, in each, uh, uh, $250 an hour each they're billing me, right, to fail. They're like, what happened? What happened, Conrad? We had shell for like five minutes. I was like, what'd you do? What'd you do? I said, well, uh, our darknet router caught, caught you. He said, your darknet what? You what? The darknet router. He's like, the what? I'm like, so I go through it. I'm like, here's what we do. 
Unrouted traffic goes to that router. You already have a router. And then we run security onion, we, we feed it to security onion. Now, what dark, the, the, the sins are not being act, right? So you see a lot of sin packets, but you actually, you'll see actual UDP payloads, things like that, ICMP payloads, right? So we run it to a darknet router, we counted it. If darknet traffic ever increases by a factor of two, someone gets woken up. That catches all scanning. They're like, like they, they, I was pretty much a, a dark, evil magician at that point. They couldn't understand. I was bending time and space in ways they'd never seen before as a blue teamer, right? Blue teamer, right? And that's all, you can simply go to the darknet router and counter via SNMP. That's all free for stuff you already own, right? You want a security onion sensor? Even better. Even better. All right. All right, folks. Uh, that's my talk <laughs> with zero seconds left. Awesome. I'll hang around for questions afterwards, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.